Hello, YouTube family. It's time to sit back, relax, and prepare for this week's video compilation, which will have you on the tip of your seat. We scan the internet for the most weird, shocking, and bizarre videos available. So have your popcorn ready and prepare to be amused. We all have that one friend who always seeks attention using made-up stories. What's the dumbest thing that he or she came up with to impress everybody but fail dramatically? Story 1. Math teacher from high school. Dude was late 60s or early 70s, and he was a butthole and terrible at teaching. Anyway, he'd go on and give the class a 15-minute speech on dedication, hard work, perseverance, etc., and relating it to the NFL, football to you non-Americans. Class would ask what the frick he's talking about, and he'd be like, oh, you didn't know? I was the starting running back for the Green Bay Packers back in whatever year. Students would look online and see there's nothing on the guy and call him out on it the next day of class. Teacher's explanation was totally fake. Like, the internet wouldn't have his info because the Packers moved to a different city later, so all the records got erased. Another time, he was going off on how he was a Marine in the Vietnam War, and all of his stories about it didn't really add up. Some kid in the class was from a big military family and asked what platoon, brigade, rank, etc. he was in, and the teacher gave an answer that didn't even exist. He wouldn't even make up that he met a famous person, but that they were or are really good friends. He didn't just meet President Bush Sr., they were roommates in college. Not only did he hang out with some famous author a lot, but he, the teacher, was the main character in one of his books. And the teacher was a big inspiration to the author. Just a bunch of stuff like that. I think there was a story about him being in charge of some covert operations or secret spy stuff, but I missed that day of class. And no, he wasn't just teasing us and messing around, he was totally serious. Kids would call him out on his stories of grandeur, and he'd double down trying to prove his case, even though no one was buying his stories or being all that impressed by them. Story 2. I told her I could not keep hearing her go on about her boyfriend, who had started using and selling drugs. Let me know when she cut ties with that crowd. Less than two hours later, I get a breathless call from a strange number. She has packed up and gotten out of his place, was staying in a motel. I asked how she got the money, and she mumbled something about a friend who met her and gave her money, but was out of town, and she couldn't stay at their actual place, huh? I figured it was crap, but decided to play along and make her give herself away. I said, oh, my sister-in-law is nearby. I'm going to send her over with some groceries. Which motel is it? Immediately she starts going on, no, no, I don't need that, don't send anyone but would not tell me the motel name. Said, oh, I don't know. I asked how you check into a motel and not know the name of it. Go look outside, read me the sign. She just kept dodging around and saying not to worry about it. She said she would call me back the next day, and we rang off. On a hunch, I called the number back, and her roommate at the boyfriend's place picked up. She hadn't gone anywhere, just called me from a different number. The roommate put her on the phone, and she started yelling at me for calling her back. I told her when she quit lying and really got help, let me know. That was the last time I heard from mom for a while. Story 3 Don't know that I have this friend in adulthood, but in childhood there was a classmate who consistently told fibs about the most random things. That he could hypnotize his dog. When challenged, he claimed he needed a strawberry to do it. And one theme that came up on a recurrent basis was his desire to get attention for nearly getting seriously hurt. Students were bombarded with stories of how he almost broke my, insert name of appendage here, while skiing or other activities. Then one day at school we were having a discussion about what careers we wanted to pursue as adults. I don't recall what other students said because things were about to go rogue quickly. This young boy said that he wanted to be a fireman. While we thought this was nice, he seemed to be focused on how it could lead to him being hurt. One girl in the class asked, why don't you look for a job where you don't get hurt like that? He replied, well, I want to get hurt. I want to commit seppuku. Pin drop. This was in second grade. I sense most of the class didn't even know what that term meant. Soon thereafter, his mother regularly showed up in the classroom to help out with grading papers and managing the students. I didn't recognize it at the time, but I'm inclined to believe this red flag of a statement prompted the teacher to notify the family who responded by sending the mom to spend more time closer to him to help. 
I hope that guy's doing okay now. Story 4. I was in medical school, and I had this junior from my home state who recently got admitted to my school. Barely a week we'd known each other, and he starts flexing on me about how he's been a playa his whole life, and how many chicks he's boned, with really vivid descriptions of how it all went down. Every day he had a story of how crazy he used to be when drinking with his friends back home, how much weed he used to do, etc. He also proudly described every time his engineer father escaped being arrested for embezzlement and corruption, washing that off with a story of how his family had been providing for less fortunate kids in his area. He had also had a lot of stories about how much money he spent on a whim, how many flights he missed on purpose because he was hungover, and yet again how many random chicks he had slept with. He more than often contradicted himself with his own stories, but that was okay because he apparently had mild amnesia due to a biking accident while being drunk from a lit AF party. I've since then left the school to reapply in a new cycle due to me being critically sick and missing most of my classes and exams there. I don't consider him a friend nor an acquaintance. In fact, I wish I never met the guy. I wouldn't like to be associated with such a d-bag pile of poop, considering the career path I've chosen. Story 5. I'm from Germany, and there's this dude in our friend group that does that all the time. One time he was showing us a sketch he made and said, This right here was never built before. It is a device that can turn off gravity. I'm the kind of guy that likes to see those guys explain themselves deeper so everyone else realizes how dumb they are. So I asked him everything about it, and it turns out he doesn't know crap about gravity. Two weeks later, he was telling us a story about a ketamine trip he had had, and everyone was enjoying the storytelling. The problem is that he thought that no one of us was watching English YouTube videos, but he was wrong. I instantly knew that he was telling a story from a YouTuber that I watch. I was cringing a lot during that 15 minutes, because he was telling it word for word. Seeing the look in his face that says... Heck yeah, they buy it. And knowing that he's lying was just way too entertaining. He's 23, by the way. One time he was telling us all of this crazy science stuff that clearly is out of a creepypasta or something stupid like that. I freaking hate that and called him out, but he wouldn't back down. I don't know how everyone else can just let them make things up and don't be bothered by it. I really freaking can't. Story 6. I had a friend in high school try to convince everyone that he came from a filthy rich family. Eventually, after a multitude of demonstrations, I became involved in one of his elaborate ploys. He came up with a story of how he needed a ride home after school, and I didn't have a reason not to, so I obliged. Uh. He directed me towards one of the most wealthy neighborhoods in my city and had me follow another car through the gates of a private community of mansions. He told me to wait for a second after I dropped him off at one of the huge butt estates. Minutes later, he came out of the house, visually distressed, and told me to drive away and leave him at a nearby park. I don't remember the story I believed him telling me as an explanation, but I later found out that he was actually from a family on welfare, and the house that he brought me to belonged to a person he briefly met, and he was angrily kicked out after he entered their house spontaneously without mentioning anything to anyone that lived there. Afterwards, I realized that his plan was for me to drop him off and validate his huge house and wealth to everyone at school. The stories he told everyone about his wealth fell through soon afterwards. Story 7 I had an online friend who said he was secretly in the Marines and then got kicked out for being too good. He was 14 at the time. He would tell me all sorts about how he's now classed as a dangerous weapon and half the government wanted to protect him whilst the other half wanted him on alive. There were lots of fables about skills and training he had and how he'd seen his best mate explode, etc. The funny thing is, I was friends with his cousin who went to my school and I would always ask about his weird cousin and his lies. He was never in the Marines. He was in the cadets for a while though and whenever I would confront Marine Boy, he would tell me that his family can't know the truth about him, and that's why his cousin wasn't aware. I ended up talking to him years later on Facebook, and brought up how funny it was that he used to pretend to be a Marine. Unfortunately, he was apparently with his girlfriend during that conversation, and I had revealed a part of his past he definitely wanted to keep secret. I found this embarrassment to be a relief, though. I was happy to know he'd at least come to his senses. Story 8 I knew one guy who would pretty much one-up everything you said to him. If he said something like, 
I have a bad back and have to take medication from time to time. He'd go on about how he had surgery several times on his back and had seen many doctors and was taking very strong medication, and so on and so forth. Among the things he claims to have experienced, he said he climbed several mountains and was preparing to climb Mount Everest. Won poetry and writing awards, had beaten famous sportsmen before they were famous when they were in junior leagues, had worked at Google and Apple, was to become an Olympian, but had his appendix removed shortly before he would have been picked, had dated a famous actress when they were both younger, flew hang gliders, skydived, skied, rafted, scuba dived, and sailed in several countries in the world, had beaten a grandmaster at chess. You get the idea. Funny thing is that, surprisingly, he is a really nice dude. He just talks way too much about himself and his exploits. What's your best what are the odds moment? Story 1. My grandfather always tells the story of how when my mother and her brothers were young, he had planned for them all to go on a family holiday to the beach, including my grandmother. They told the kids about it, and because they weren't doing so well financially, they had incorporated it into Christmas because Santa hadn't brought much. Mom and her brothers were all so excited to go to the beach. As the holiday got closer, even though my pop had been working overtime for months, as had my nan, it was clear they weren't going to have enough money. They decided they couldn't do that to the kids, so after consideration, they decided to just go, to leave their house repayments and multiple bills unpaid and take what they could. While they were on holiday, they went to the beach. When my pop got out of the water first, he put his clothes on and waited for the others. It wasn't until they got home he realized he had put someone else's shorts on. He went back down to the beach to find the owner and to get his own pants back because he had a small amount of money in his pockets. Of course, the owner was nowhere to be seen. It was at this time that he checked the pockets of the shorts he had on to see if there was any ID. There wasn't, but there was a scrunched up tab ticket for a horse named Mystic Marie. He found that odd because my grandmother's name is Marie. So on his way down to the shops that night to buy fish and chips for dinner, he stopped at the pub to have a quick beer and remembered the ticket. He says to this day he doesn't know why he didn't just throw it away, but he decided to check and see if it had won. It had, and he had won two million dollars more than enough to cover the, or is that two thousand dollars from back in the day? more than enough to cover their holiday and pay the bills and do some extra activities with the kids as well. He said he had never had that much luck again. It's his favorite story. Still to this day, every time he tells it, you can tell that he still can't quite believe it. He always says, and to think that I was worried that I had lost five bucks when I lost my own shorts. Story two. I was staying around a friend's place for a week to get away from my parents. He had this toy slot machine thing that would decide to randomly go off with this ding diddling ding diddling ding diddling thingy unprompted every 10 minutes. It began to tick us off very quickly. After a while we decided to take the slot machine out into the woods around the back of his house and show it some manners. So armed with the slot machine that didn't know when to shut up, some deodorant and a cigarette lighter, we snuck out into the woods in the dark of the night. Once we got as deep as we could. It wasn't a particularly big wooded area, and it was basically right next to a house. We took the lid off of a can of deodorant, shoved it into the part of the machine that money comes out of, and lit the plastic tip at the top of the can. It was at this moment that the slot machine started its freaking infuriating ringing again. It obviously had caught on to our plans, and was doing whatever a slot machine's version of crying for help is. Somebody must have heard, as the nearest house's kitchen light turned on, and a woman began glaring at us from behind the glass. So we decided to get the frick out of there and just leave the machine behind. As we were walking, a faint pop rang out from behind us. Mm, must have been the deodorant, we thought. That was a little bit underwhelming. All of a sudden, in the distance, the slot machine starts ringing again. Just as the final ding-diddling rang through the air, a huge bang hit our ears. It scared the crap out of us, and we stood for a moment in shock. As we stood, an ever so slightly messed up deodorant can fell from the sky and landed directly in front of our feet. We were a good 30 to 40 meters from the scene of the crime. 
The slot machine didn't make it. Story 3. It was a mild and drab late afternoon in Innsbruck, with my brother and a few mates in a bar around the old town having a few beers and casually watching the Boxing Day soccer match between Newcastle and Manchester United. Sipping on my beer, I looked up at the score and then to my brother and said, Newcastle will score in the 68th minute. To which he replied, Ha! Get boned! If this is a live match, then I bet you they won't. So when the next round of beers came from the bar, we were assured by the keep that it was in fact live, and the wager was set. If there were not to score in the 68th minute, I would have to buy him a kebab later tonight. However, if they were to score in the 68th minute, and because the odds are so greatly against me, he would have to pay our bar tab for the table, buy me drinks for the continuation of the night, and a kebab. This bet was made at like the fifth minute. The game was live. Kept watching, smoked some shisha, generally just hanging cool for almost an hour. When it got to the 66th minute, Newcastle hadn't looked like scoring all game. Wasn't really watching it, but they were down by heaps. So my brother started getting cocky, telling me what meat he wanted, garlic yogurt, cheese, which salads and sauces, etc. Then it breaks over into the 67th minute, and he's like, Aw yeah, I'm getting the kebab, guys. That was the dumbest bet ever. And then suddenly, they get the ball, run the field to the goal, and score. I lose my crap. I was up on the table yelling stuff in his face. I could not believe what just happened. He was so unhappy, he kept asking the bartender if it was a live match, and it was. And there I was, screaming in his face. All our mates at the bar were in tears laughing at him, because less than a minute before, he was so cocky about it. Needless to say, more drinks were ordered, he paid for everything that night, and everyone got pretty loose. But I still bought him a kebab later on. Story 4 I was living in San Antonio a few years back for school, and a friend of mine that I met in College Station had moved to New Braunfels to be a mortician. I was out at lunch with a separate group of friends at a deli, and a guy approached me who was making balloon animals, or whatever, for some party company. They did all kinds of things for parties, like rentals for popcorn machines, or moon jumpers, clowns, party accessories like tablecloths, etc. He was really nice, and he gave me his business card. Anyway, flash forward to about a month later, and my friend from NB called me up, kind of upset. We met up at Olive Garden and started talking. She had embalmed this guy who had written all over his body in permanent marker who his best friends were, and his family, and quotes he thought were memorable. And she was upset because, by law, she wasn't allowed to tell anybody about the marker and stuff. She didn't even think the police really saw all of it. He had passed away of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the chest, and the weird thing to me was how meticulously planned out he had done it all. He made sure all his debts were paid, and rented a hotel, and wrote notes to everyone, and calmly called his family and friends on the phone to say goodbye. When I went to pay, I had the guy from the deli's business card in my wallet, and she saw it and exclaimed, That's the guy! The chances are probably pretty astronomical that I ran into a random dude in a deli in a city of 1.3 million and my friend in another city embalmed the same guy and we both know each other and etc etc. The whole situation still boggles my mind. Story 5. I was driving down the highway. There are very few cars on the road. Mine and two others that I can remember. Mr. Squirrel makes a terrible life-changing decision. Squirrel is pretty far in front of me. It gets hit by one of the only two other cars I see on the road and skips across. By the grace of the seven squirrel gods, it was okay. It took off in the other direction, towards safety, immediately regretting, one would assume, its decision to cross the road in the first place. When an eagle, yes, a freaking eagle, swoops down out of nowhere and snags the little mustard... The eagle grabbed Mr. Squirrel and did a low-altitude flyover of the highway with it just to bust its balls. It skimmed the ground right in front of me, and I was inches from running it over. When the second car present with me on the highway immediately to my left, which was a Hyundai Tiburon, not sure why I remember that, takes them both out. Mercifully, I saw neither move again in my mirror after kissing the grill at 75 miles per hour, that's 120 kilometers per hour for you peens and nicks. The whole thing probably took three seconds, but it was three seconds of awesome. Story 6. 
Many years ago, when I was serving in the Air Force, we used to regularly pull pranks on each other. One of the most common ones involved using charged capacitors. You would either slip them into someone's pocket or simply throw them at someone and shout, Catch! When they caught it, they would get zapped and much hilarity would ensue. I finished my shift in the bay and left to go and see my then-girlfriend in Nottingham. I used to catch the train as it was easier than driving and trying to find a parking spot. As usual, the train was crowded, and I was standing alongside a group of other commuters when the guy beside me suddenly screamed and collapsed. Unbeknownst to me, one of my colleagues had slipped a charged capacitor into my coat pocket in the changing room at work and unwittingly foiled a would-be pickpocket who got the shock of his life when he tried to lift my wallet. This assertive pickpocketer should have heeded Plankton's advice and not tried to be so insertive. Beep beep. People who won or inherited a lot of money, what are your horror stories from people begging for your money? Story 1. I'm dealing with this stuff right now. My great aunt and godmother was a lesbian. Her partner, my Aunt Kitty, had been with her since the 1950s, when my grandmother moved to New York. Auntie Kitty was disowned by her family when it came out that she was with a woman. My grandmother died when I was 12 and left my Auntie Kitty everything in her will, which made things strained with my dad's family, though my dad and one of his brothers still talked to her. I moved to New York at 18 for school, and knowing no one else in the city, we became close. She was thrilled that I wanted to have a relationship with her and spend time with her and didn't hesitate to think of her as my aunt, even though she technically wasn't. She was legit the greatest, and we spent holidays together, and she would come to things I worked on, and I knew all her friends, and she knew mine. I basically spent a decade with her, being like another grandmother to me. She died a few months ago, and it sucks. I miss her a lot, to put it lightly, but she was in her 90s and lived a long life. Thing was, she left everything to me. Now, I knew she had money, it was hard to miss, but I didn't know how much money she had. I ended up with a decent-sized amount of cash and investments, a brownstone in the city, and a place on the beach in the Carolinas. Her family came out of the woodwork when she died, sniffing around for money and demanding I give them the beach house, or cash, or whatever. Her will states explicitly that they're not to receive anything from her estate, and it's all to go to me. But they're threatening to sue since they're sure she wanted to give them something even though she hadn't talked to any of them in over half a century, and in some cases, had never even met them. On the opposite side of things, my dad's sisters and brothers are ticked off that they didn't get anything because they'd occasionally send her a Christmas card. None of them view it as fair that I was given everything when they were giving nothing. None of them showed up to her funeral. None of them properly had seen her or talked to her in years, except my dad, One of my aunts has gone so far as harassing my boyfriend since he's apparently only in it for the money, despite the fact that he had a better relationship with her than she did and had to help me plan her funeral. It's basically a poop show, and I hate it. Story 2. On a throwaway, so I'm not outed. A few years ago, a family member was killed. My parents secretly sued the person or the company responsible, and we were awarded millions in a settlement. To this day, I haven't shared this info with anyone because it's very personal. We don't want anyone to think we profited from their death because that wasn't our intention. We wanted to make sure the spouse was cared for financially. After about two years of my parents being involved in court, the settlement was finalized. During this time, my sibling's spouse was cared for emotionally and financially by my family. After the case was settled, the spouse was awarded several million as one of the stipulations my parents set. Immediately after, they disappeared from our lives entirely. It was extremely disappointing to my family when that happened, especially considering all we had been doing to keep them going. Imagine having a son or daughter suddenly die and having to fight lawyers for years to give their spouse a happy life, only to have them take the money and run once it was all finished. Yes, my family did receive a rather large sum, and we had a dinner on his birthday, to which this news was shared with all the siblings. It was a shock learning why the spouse had completely cut us off, and that I'd suddenly become rich as a result of everything. It feels wrong and slightly embarrassing, but I'm sure my siblings would be proud that they could help the family after their death. Still, I'll never tell anyone what happened because I don't want my siblings' life story tarnished any further. I think everyone in my family feels the same. Nothing has changed in our lives afterward. At first, I felt extremely guilty spending a dime of that money, but over time, I've learned to appreciate the opportunities that it has given me. All of us have continued down the same path as before, although my parents have been traveling a lot, and I don't blame them one bit. 
Story 3. My mom and dad won big once at a casino around 25 years back, one of those once-in-a-lifetime medium-level jackpots, around $10,000. Most of the money went into bills and a few family fun things over the course of a summer. However, during that time, my aunt and a few of my mother's relatives kept bullying her for cash. Her relatives kept demanding she owed them some of the cash because the casino trip was with them. They invited my folks along and drove them. So, by their logic, they were obliged to be part of the winnings. My aunt, on the other hand, just kept begging so she could help out with her kids' debts. They're very spoiled kids, and over the years have run themselves into the ground financially, and every time their mother, my aunt, digs them out. My folks never gave in, even though my mother's relatives threatened to sue, which they didn't, and my aunt eventually just moved on. After this, no one on my mother's side would go with my folks without making clear that if they won, they would get some of the money. Needless to say, my parents never went with them again, and for a time, went on their own. I was young at the time and used to not have much growing up because we were very poor. This cash really did us a service, but the things that stand out to me the most are all the abusive calls my mother and father got about this money and how I found out later on that these people beyond my aunt all made near six-figure incomes. They didn't need the money, they just wanted it. Story 4. I won around 5,000 pounds on a football, soccer, accumulator a few years ago. Not a lot really, but a lot for a 23-year-old. To cut a long story short, because I didn't pay off my father's credit card debt with it, he fell out with me and pretty much tried to ruin my life. He told my then partner I had a gambling problem. I didn't, unless spending five pounds a week on football constitutes a problem. Got my mother to call my work to tell them I had a problem, which resulted in work getting a freaking counselor in to talk to me, and basically preying on my family's love for me by making them all make me feel horrendously guilty for ever placing a bet in the first place. It all reached a head when I came home to my partner in tears and my mother and father sat comforting her on the sofa, proceeding to tell me if she didn't know she could trust me and why couldn't I just admit how long I'd been gambling for. I physically removed my father from my house that night and told him to never darken my doorstep again. All over five grand. Parents are sometimes toxic and an awful influence on your life. I cut him out because of it, and which sadly has meant my relationship with my mother has taken a hit, but it was honestly the best thing I ever did. Don't be afraid of doing so if they add nothing but negativity to your life. Story 5. I won a lawsuit settlement almost after dying in a fire. I was under 18 at the time of the incident, but was 18 when it finally settled. My mother told me unless I gave her half of my settlement, I would have to find a new place to live. I was in my senior year of high school when this happened. She said she deserved it because she was the only one in my life who was always there for me. I didn't give her the money. She kicked me out and tried to keep some of my personal belongings. Not like I had much since everything was lost in the fire. We didn't talk for months until she randomly showed up at my house one day. She asked me for rent money and gave me some BS sob story. I wrote her a check for $5,000, hoping it'd make her go away. It did, for a time. She and I barely spoke, until years later when I was pregnant. A few years ago, I was in a bad car accident, hit by an 18-wheeler, and got some money. I told no one, especially my mom. She has insisted numerous times I was entitled to a settlement for it and should speak to a lawyer she found. She took it upon herself to talk to lawyers on my behalf, or tried to. I just ignored her for months, until she finally gave up. Story 6. I inherited a fair amount of money when my grandfather passed away. My husband and I were planning on using it to purchase our first house. We had been saving, but clearly could have a much lower mortgage with this windfall. Well, my husband works a side business where he builds custom vehicles. One friend who was running out of money and his car was only about halfway done found out about the inheritance, only because we stupidly asked his advice on mortgage options, and decided he was going to pull his car because he didn't have the funds to finish it and then sue us for ten grand. And unfortunately, we got a lawyer and ended up spending over $3,500 to have him say that the customer usually is right, and we'd be further ahead to just settle and pay him, because the lawyer fees would be much more if we continue to fight. Breaks my heart to this day that a good chunk of my inheritance went to pay that dong bag off, so he could take his vehicle somewhere else to get it finished. Story 7. My grandmother has dementia and her husband is dying of cancer. They have over a million in assets that have been divided between four sons. One son is a mentally ill junkie who has been in and out of jail. He has already been promised their house as his share of inheritance, but he has been doing all he can to get more from his mother while her husband has been in the hospital slowly dying the last few months. He steals her credit cards, opens new ones in her name, and attempts to access their money through online banking. 
My step-grandfather is trying to get her declared mentally incompetent to prevent my uncle from manipulating her finances. But between his health issues and being in and out of the hospital, it's proving difficult. When her husband dies, which will unfortunately be soon, he plans on moving into their house, which he already sees as his, and most likely milking my grandmother dry. The sad part is she has dementia and has no idea what's going on. Story 8. I was lucky enough to have very successful grandparents. I'm also lucky enough to still have all of my grandparents at the age of 31. They're all over 82. The grandfather of importance to this conversation only has an 8th grade education, but he built a strong business, water well drilling. When each of his seven grandchildren were born, he deposited $87,000 the year I was born, I assume that's the same for the others, into a managed trust. We don't make a habit of discussing money, but there are a few requirements. Namely, I won't have complete control over it until I'm 50. I get a statement every fall, and I know my retirement is taken care of. What happened when I told my spouse? We dated for three years, been together eight, and it was close to three years before I even mentioned it. Aside from my spouse, it's no one's business. Why on earth would I tell people of my impending windfall? Be smart, people. Keep your bank accounts out of conversation. What is one way you've seen someone screw up their life with just a couple of words? Story 1. This is a real story. A few years ago, I was an avid World of Warcraft player, and one of my best friends had finally started playing the game. This was great for our friendship because I had moved to another state, and it was something we could do that was basically like us getting to hang out. We'd log in to WoW a few times a week after work and shoot the crap over Skype. At this time, he was also dating this girl who also played WoW. Their relationship had been going strong for about a year, and she was starting to get to the point where she wanted to move in with him. However, he had been dodging that subject and stating he'd never lived with a girl before, which he had, and wasn't ready to go there just yet. One day, he and I are on a Skype call doing our WoW thing. His girlfriend is also in the room with him, playing on his Xbox off in the background. I start talking about my wife or something, going into a funny story about living with her, which we get a chuckle out of. My friend tries to one-up the story by telling me something he experienced while living with his former girlfriend, and he said, Dude, when I lived with Melissa, blah blah blah. Immediately, my heart sank. I sent him a DM via WoW that simply said, hey, You done messed up, dude. You just said you lived with your ex. And I swear to Christ, I heard his balls shoot up from his nutsack to his throat over Skype. He replied back in-game, yeah, it's cool, bro. I don't think she heard. She's playing Xbox. Xbox. Let's just play it off. In my mind, there's no way she didn't hear that stuff. I pictured her picking up that sentence like when Peter Parker went into Spidey Sense mode during the first Spider-Man movie, and he could hear every little detail around him, including a fly buzzing through the air. Anyway, the tone of our Skype conversation went from laughing to awkward silence pretty quickly. It's funny because I was legit nervous, even though it had nothing to do with me. My wingman instincts were in full panic mode. We played WoW for a few more minutes, and he DMs me, Oh man, she just got up and left without even saying anything. I gotta go. That was it. He was freaking dead. Story 2 Two days after my head cracked open, I had a really bad day. My four-year-old daughter, who I love, wasn't picked up by her respite care family, and they were completely unreachable. My first grade son was running a fever, so he was home from school. My daughter has anger and aggression issues, and she threw three gigantic tantrums that day. A social worker even came to my home and checked on us that day. I'll admit I was really mentally messed up before the car accident, but I was just depressed. After begging anyone I could think of calling to come help because my daughter was trying to rip my staples and stitches out, I called the social worker and said someone had to come help or get her because she was downright terrifying. The next thing I know, the police come and took my children. I've never gotten them back. I can't fathom how many people and social workers ignored me. It makes me sick. Not even a week into foster placement, my daughter was behaving like she did at home and was put into a psychiatric hospital. She was four years old. To this day, she still has violent behavior with no common trigger. She's finally old enough to be medicated, but as far as I know, it's caused her to gain weight. That's it. She's just gone and bit a classmate and took out a chunk. I'm scared of her and for her. How and why? 
I ache because I shouldn't have been left alone after a social worker watched her behaviors hours earlier and knew I had a head injury. I never was charged with abuse or neglect, but my family was destroyed because I asked for help. Story 3 Not sure if this screwed up his life, but changed it in some way, I'm sure. This happened at one of my old jobs about 10 years ago. There was an opening for a management position. My coworker that sits in the queue behind me applied for it. There were actually a number of guys on our team applying, so the vice president is doing a lunch interview each day with the guys applying. Two or three guys have already done it. One day, sitting in my cube, spun around, so I'm facing my coworker's desk. We're talking about whatever. VP walks up and says, Hey, how about we go have some lunch? My treat. My coworker looks at him, dead in the eye, and says, Oh, I don't eat lunch. Vice President, Um, oh, okay. How about we go downstairs and grab a coffee then? A couple of guys in my hometown were looking for something to steal so they could sell it to buy drugs. They come to a house where no one was supposed to be home, and one guy gets out of the car and goes to the house to steal a grill. A friend of the homeowner happened to be there and came out when he stepped on the porch. He tells the friend that he's looking for his dog, so the guy walks out into the yard to help look for it. The robber panics and pulls out a gun and shoots the man in the back of the head. At 21, he started a life sentence for a really stupid red rum. Story 4 Anyone remember the Balloon Boy incident? This happened maybe six or seven years ago. A family where the dad was some sort of inventor made a weather balloon that flew off and they panicked because one of their younger boys, who was around six at the time, was missing. They thought he was up in the rogue weather balloon. News crews called it viral as cameras followed the balloon around, even panicking when they saw something fall out of it. Turns out the boy was found safe, playing in their attic. They still became viral, and news outlets wanted to interview the family, and Dad was more than happy to comply. Well, kids being innocent kids during one major news network interview, the sleepy boy said, We did it for a show. You can see that look in the dad's eyes of, I messed up. Revealing that the rogue balloon boy was staged by the dad so that the dad can shop for a reality TV show for his family, after that they went under a hailstorm of investigation. CPS was called, and they were sued for the hoax. Big mess. I don't feel sorry for the dad. I feel sorry for his kids going through public scrutiny just because daddy wants his 15 minutes of fame. Story 5. A few years back, one of the students attending the university I work at got caught trying to sneak a poop load of drugs into a local nightclub. The first we found out about it was when some police officers turned up with a warrant to go through his room, and I was the lucky person chosen to let them in. So I opened the door, and oh dear lord, there's drugs everywhere. If you've ever seen one of those old-timey pick-and-mix shops with all the sweets in big glass jars, imagine that, but with pills and wraps of powder instead. Everything else was all super neat and tidy, and it was one of the cleanest student rooms I'd ever been in just that every flat surface had a container full of drugs or some sort of other paraphernalia on it. This student was in his fourth year of a master's degree and due to finish in three months. He ended up being charged with possession with intent to supply, and since a lot of the stuff he had in there was Class A, is now going to be in prison for a decade or two. He was also expelled, of course, and will still be on the hook for £60,000 of student debt afterwards. Story 6 I saw somebody screw up their own life and somebody else's simultaneously. A few years ago, my 15-year-old cousin got pregnant. She wanted an abortion. My aunt wouldn't let her get one. Adoption wasn't an option either. You're not getting an abortion. You made your bed, so you lie in it. So my cousin carried the baby to term and had a healthy baby girl. She dropped out of school because my aunt wanted nothing to do with the baby, so she had to tend to it full time. A week of this goes on, and my cousin decides enough is enough, and runs away with her 17-year-old boyfriend. My cousin had straight A's, until she was basically forced to drop out. She still doesn't have her degree, and is still living with her boyfriend somewhere in Washington. He has a construction job, and my cousin has an Etsy shop. They're doing okay, but I know my cousin always wanted to go to college. My aunt had to raise the baby, and is still raising her. She's 45, and did not want another kid. Story 7. About a year ago in my job, we were doing trial days. We were hiring three new people and had five people in for a trial day. 
one person a day, Monday to Friday. My manager asked me to email her that night to let me know how the girl I had found for the trial day got on, and if she was worth hiring. So everything is going great. Lovely girl, very easy to get along with, and adapted very easily. So I'm making some conversation, and she mentions that she goes from job to job a lot, and gets bored of jobs very easily. Literally, because of this, I had to tell my manager not to hire her, because we'd only be replacing her soon enough. I still don't understand why someone would say what she said during a trial for a job. She shot herself in the foot by saying that. Although, on a side note, the three people we did hire are still working for us a year later, so I suppose there's some happy ending. Story 8. My step-uncle recently got married and, while super drunk at the reception, made a cringe-inducing speech about how he knew a really good divorce lawyer that would guarantee him alimony in the settlement. When the smiles turned to gasps, he quickly backpedaled and said he wouldn't divorce her right away. He would get his money's worth from the wedding. Being a champ and still sticking to his guns to make a laugh, he boldly claimed he would red rum and kill to make more money than she did so she would be well taken care of. Everyone at the reception hall was completely dumbfounded, while my brother and I, who attended with our wives, tried to stifle our laughter at the train wreck we just watched in slow motion. The bride cried and ran out while my uncle chased after her yelling, and I kid you not, what did I say? What are your best, this customer is totally trying to screw us over, stories? Story 1. I used to work for The Source, Radio Shack in the U.S., in a very low traffic area, so we wouldn't get any people who come in just to browse, like at the malls. People come in with an idea of what they wanted, and it was up to me to get it for them. So I'm alone, the manager's at lunch, and this old, frail lady walks in. I ask if I can help her. And she gives me a scoff and rolls her eyes. I need a cell phone. I help her out as much as I can. I tell her that pay-as-you-go are the cheapest rates and have no contracts to bind you. She seems pleased, but decides to purchase a Rogers phone on a two-year contract. Whatever, more commission for me. Three weeks later, she comes in unhappy and asks to return the phone. I explain to her that it would cost around $400 to cancel the plan she has created and that she's too late for a refund, 15 days max. She gets ticked off and storms out. Two months later, she comes in, attitude up the wazoo, telling me that I sold her a busted phone, and she wants all of her money back. I was alone again, so I asked her to give me her phone so I could look at it. I present my hand, and she reaches over to hand it to me. At the last second, she moves her hand a bit to the side and drops the phone on the tips of my fingers, where it then falls to the floor. She goes, ape crap. You broke my phone. I want my money back, and I want a new phone. Blah, blah, blah. I try to explain to her that her Nokia 3100-esque phone, 3100, will not break from a simple fall. You would need to throw the phone into the fire of Mount Doom to destroy it. She doesn't agree and starts yapping. I tell her that even if her phone was an expensive smartphone like my Blackberry, it would take the fall and still work. So drop it, she says. I ask if I drop my phone from the same height and it still works, if she will leave, and she agrees. Now I'm not going to drop my brand new Blackberry I purchased just weeks before to some dumb old coot that is sour because she didn't listen to my first advice. I think quick on my feet and remember the stash of fake plastic phones right under the counter. I grab one that looks just like my phone and kamehameha that crap right into the floor where it shatters into a hundred pieces. We both stare at the pieces for a sec and she's astonished. She fumbles with her things and takes her phone and never comes back. That's so awesome. You probably startled the crap out of her. Story two. I sell used clothing on eBay for a living. It isn't much, but I earn more than I would with a full-time minimum wage job. Anyways, I sold a pair of dress pants to a gentleman living in Portland, Oregon. A week and a half later, he wanted to return the pants, stating they were not to his satisfaction, and that he wanted me to refund him for the return shipping. My response? Sure, no problem. Just send them back and I'll refund your original sale price, plus original shipping, plus return shipping, once I receive them. Him. Great, I'm currently stationed in the Philippines, and I'm sending them back right now. 
The shipping costs will be $26.95. Me. Uh, unfortunately, I can't refund your shipping costs from the Philippines, since I originally shipped them to Portland. I'm more than happy to refund you the cost from Portland. I hope you understand. He was obviously not happy about this, but sent them back anyway. Fast forward a month or so, when I opened the package, I took out the pants, only to discover what looked like crap smeared all over the garment. I mean, totally covered. I'm 100% positive I never sold them like that. I can only assume he took the return shipping to heart. I waited a week to contact the man about the pants. Below was the conversation. Me. I received the pants, thank you. Him. Did you see the pants? He wants me to blow up about the crappy return condition, but I reserve myself. Me. I did, thank you. At this point, it had been more than 60 days since the transaction, making it too late for him to file a claim with eBay or PayPal. I never refunded him anything, just a thank you. Moral, if someone intentionally does something to pee you off, never ever give them the satisfaction of knowing how it made you feel. Story 3. I used to work at a Reebok outlet store. Our return policy was the same as a lot of places. Receipt means you can get money back. No receipt means you can only get store credit or exchange. We had a guy that would come in every week and exchange 25 polo shirts in all different sizes and styles. It was always 25 shirts, and nobody ever seemed to remember him carrying the return shirts into the store. He was pretty clearly just walking into the store, grabbing 50 shirts and exchanging 25 of them for the other 25. I don't know why he needed that many shirts. Maybe he was selling them or something. Anyway, I made up my mind that I'm not going to let this guy get away with it anymore. I didn't even care that he was stealing from the store, I just didn't like that he thought he was being clever. So the next time he came in, I watched him like a hawk. I saw him do exactly what we thought, just grabbing 50 shirts and walking up to the counter to exchange half of them for the other half. Except before he could say anything, I said, Wow, buying a lot of shirts today, or something like that. He said, no, I'm actually returning these for these. I just replied, Sir, you can't return shirts that you haven't bought yet. He got all indignant and defensive, but obviously realized he was caught. So he left the shirts on the counter and started to leave the store, saying, You just lost yourself a lifetime customer. I told him to stop and said completely straight-faced, Sir, we have cameras in the store and in the parking lot, so we know you were stealing and we know your license plate number. I also have your name and address from the ID you gave me for the returns. You're going to buy all 50 of those shirts, or I'm going to call the police. He stopped, hastily walked over, bought all 50 shirts, left the store, and never came back. And no, we did not have any security cameras. Persuade. Intimidate. Bribe. Story 4. I used to work for a furniture company in the mid-90s. One day we got a memo that there was a former coworker who was using stolen cards to do in-store pickups or deliveries to fake addresses, like an apartment, but they would pick up the furniture in the apartment lobby, claiming the elevator was broken or something. The FBI was getting involved because it was in the amounts of thousands of dollars across state lines. A few days later, I got a call, a big order, the kind of order that would blow over quota and give me a bonus. Can you deliver this to New Jersey? Sure. I took down the credit card info. Then I asked for a callback number so I could relate the shipping info. They hesitated. I said, MasterCard required it. Let me give you a visa then. Uh-huh. Okay. I told that info and then said, Oh, uh, I forgot. Visa does too. I'll call you back, they said. So I called the home office and told them I think it was those guys. The M.O. checked out, and they said if they call back, try and get an Amex card, and then don't ask for a callback number. Just set up delivery. And hours later, they call back, got my assistant, and I told her to just take the order. When it was completed, she had an Amex card order for some ungodly amount. I called the home office, and they arranged a sting with the FBI. Later, the drivers told me what happened. They had to make a rendezvous point where they loaded a bunch of armed agents into the truck. Then, once the woman signed the bill of lading, the FBI goon squad jumped from the truck and arrested her and four accomplices without much resistance. Later, MasterCard, Visa, and Amex gave me reward checks for recovering stolen cards. Sweet. 
They used to give out $75 checks for that, but stopped doing it so much when instant authorization became popular. Story 5. Okay, this is my best. Worked at a certain retail computer store. Customer comes in with a shopping cart filled to the brim with UPS boxes that were sent from the online store of the company I work for. All in all, it's about 15 grand worth of servers and high-end computers. He wants me to return them for him in cash on the spot. Aside from the fact that the servers are both custom and not even available in retail stores, there is no way I could hand this guy $15,000 in cash and let him walk off. I explain all of this. He needs to return them to the online store he bought them from. I don't even carry these products, etc. And he loses his crap screaming, seriously screaming, about what a thief I am and how much money he's wasted on my company and how he will have my head. Me and a manager tried to calm him down, but he was freaking out, so we called security. He retreated to just beyond the border of the store and stood 10 yards away, still screaming about what a terrible person I am. Security comes and escorts him away. He's banned from the store. His photo goes on the wall, name taken down, all that. One week later, I kid you the crap not, the dude comes back in with a shaved head, wearing huge aviators, quietly approaches me and requests the exact same thing. He looked like the dude from Taxi Driver at this point, so I'm marginally scared he's about to stab me or something. I go, man, we told you you can't come around here anymore. I can't help you with this. He says to me, oh, uh, that was my twin. He causes lots of problems for me like this. I'm sure we can move past it. I'm like stunned. I go get my manager and he repeats the story again. We are pretty much so stunned. All I can say is, we just can't help you with this. I'm sorry. You have to leave. He loses it again, yelling, calling me a thief, threatening to come find me later. This time, the real cops come and escort him away again. Crazy sucker. Too long didn't read. Crazy sucker shaved his head to trick me into believing he was his problem-causing twin and got me to give him $15,000 in exchange for boxes of product. What only exists because people are stupid. Story 1. Betty Crocker once made a cake mix that was add water only, no need for other ingredients, and it came out the most perfect moist cake. People stopped buying it because adding water didn't make them feel like they were baking a cake. Betty Crocker took away ingredients and needed people to add milk and eggs to the mix so people will buy their cake mix again. Turns out that a large part of baking is that feeling like you actually made something. However, as Laura Shapiro observed in Something from the Oven, reinventing dinner in 1950s America, while Dichter's work was influential, its precise role in the success of the cake mix is unclear. For starters, although it may not have been a point articulated by the homemakers Dichter surveyed, the fact was that fresh eggs produced superior cakes. Using complete mixes, which included dried eggs, resulted in cakes that stuck to the pan, had poor texture, had a shorter shelf life, and often tasted too strongly of eggs. Chances are, Shapiro wrote, if adding eggs persuaded some women to overcome their aversion to cake mixes, it was at least partly because fresh eggs made for better cakes. Furthermore, the two food companies who came to dominate the cake mix market in this era, General Mills and Pillsbury, adopted opposite approaches. The former chose to go with fresh egg mixes, while Pillsbury opted to offer complete mixes. If the form of eggs used were truly the tipping point that saved the cake mix industry, then sales of one of these companies' products should have tanked in comparison to the others. Story 2. When my aunt died, I ended up with my mom and uncle talking to the funeral home advisor. When they were discussing cremation, the funeral advisor made my uncle sign a form that he understands cremation is irreversible. The Forbidden Jigsaw Puzzle Yep, I had to do that at my dad's. Can't recall with my mom, but she had a viewing before being cremated, but when it comes to a funeral stuff, I'm a lot more lenient. Many people go into a funeral home are within a day or so of their relative dying and might not be in the right state of mind. The contract is both protection and a firm reminder to the grieving person because grieving people might flip-flop in their decisions. I see it as a wake the frick up, it's permanent warning. I had the great misfortune of taking my hysterical aunt to the funeral home the morning after she found my uncle, who was 50, on alive. 
She was a 44-year-old widow, insisted the whole way there he would be cremated, but when we got in and she started talking to the director, she became hysterical all over again and told him she wanted family to be able to see my uncle and she didn't want him to burn. So there was a viewing. Maybe it's in poor taste to mention this, but since we were on the topic of cremation anyway, I couldn't help but think of one of my favorite poems, The Cremation of Sam McGee by Robert Service. It's an eerie tale of a prospector succumbing to the harsh cold of the Alaskan wilderness. If you're interested in my rendition of the poem, there's a video of me reading it on my channel, Brother Goose, which I think sets a good vibe for campfire stories. Might be a good time to listen to it this time of year. Story 3. Many reactions to the Super Size Me film. In the years since the movie was released, fast food restaurants have tried to appear healthier. Many people acted as though it provided a huge revelation. We watched it in my high school health class, and I didn't understand the point. Fast food is unhealthy. Eating nothing but McDonald's is bad for you. Did people not know this? Or was it just another one of those instances where people pretended to care because that was the cool, trending topic for a bit? The knee-jerk reactions from people who act like having a fast food burger once in a while is going to automatically kill you. That's way different from eating multiple fast food meals per day like what's-his-name in the movie did. Hey men, I like the movie because it was kind of interesting to see the effects, but who the heck didn't know that eating McDonald's for every meal, or any other fast food for that matter, was not a good idea? Reminds me of a science project I had to do in grade school. My idea was to show the effects of acid rain. One plant was watered normally, the other was watered with a 3 to 1 mixture of some sort of acid and water. Oddly enough, the straight acid fed plant died. Story 4. Internet Scams tons of idiots out there. It crosses all genders, ages, races, and education level. But man, if people aren't freaking dumb as a box of rocks. Way too many people on the internet even come to r slash scams asking about scams they either fell for or are about to. It's sad, really. I can't imagine how one could ever send a stranger money sight unseen. I don't even part with money to people I know. Can't imagine giving even a penny to strangers. I work with older adults, and they are prime targets for scammers. I had a lady tell me she got a phone call from a man who said he was from the internet. He wanted to fix her computer for X reason. She didn't believe him and hung up. So far, so good. The jerk actually called back, and because he called back, she thought it was true. Gave him her email password, etc., and ultimately lost her computer. Scams against older adults are more sad and desperate. Last year, my grandpa got a call from Microsoft telling him that his computer had a virus, which he told me about it afterwards. He said, I knew it was a scam because I don't have Microsoft. I have Windows. Story 5. Stupid is probably going a bit far, but there are plenty of products that were massively unpopular because they worked too well and people just didn't get them. The best example I can think of is Febreze which was designed as a scent eradicator, and was, by its very nature, completely odorless. The only problem is that people get used to their own personal brand of stank, so they couldn't tell the difference between their own smelly butt home before and after it was sprayed. They had to put a scent into the product that was designed to get rid of scents just so people would appreciate it actually had been used, after which it started selling like crazy like how people thought vacuum cleaners weren't working because they were too quiet. So sound engineers had to make vacuums louder on vacuums and cars and potato chips. As someone sensitive to sounds, I hate this so much. Story 6. Signs at the supermarket telling people not to wash their hands in the fish tanks or the tanks of any other sea creatures. This should be an unspoken rule, but because it was unspoken, some stupid butt dill pickle dough decided to wash their hands in the dang tanks. Edit, I should not have said any other sea creatures. Obviously, certain tanks will have the tops off, but for eels, lobster, and other select animals, the tops are on. How the heck did they wash their hands in the tanks? I've never been in a position to touch the water as far as I know. It's a supermarket where they have the tops off the tanks, I guess. Stupid people get stupid ideas. Story 7. Walk-in income tax preparation businesses, like H&R Block, etc. Complicated tax situations need an accountant or CPA, 
but the majority of taxes prepared while you wait are extremely simple and can be prepared by anyone capable of reading and using a calculator. And in other countries, the government just does the taxes for you. There's no reason we can't do that in the U.S., other than h and Block and TurboTax lobbying against it. If you don't file your taxes on time, the IRS will do it for you, and then screw it up six ways from Sunday. I've been fighting them for the past year because, no, I don't owe additional taxes. They owe me. Story 8. That warning at the end of every pharma ad. Don't take Repressitol if you are allergic to Repressitol. Or any of its ingredients. What are the ingredients? 2% Pressitolium HCI, 98% fillers. In case this was meant to be a jab at the companies, fillers are actually super important. Depending on the medication, for example a topical cream, they can assist in absorption or alleviation of certain side effects, increase shelf life, or otherwise help out. The main use is to prevent easily overdosing though, specifically in oral medication. Because, I don't know about you, but I can't measure out exactly 0.5 milliliters of presetolium at home. Story 9. Warning stickers. Arguably, some might be beneficial, however, a lot of them are added on because someone did something stupid, or in fear of doing something stupid, a sticker got slapped on. I go to several anime and video game conventions, and I sometimes see very specific rules that make me laugh because I know there was some incident and they made a rule about it. Stuff like, no wearing roller skates while you're also wearing a leash. Costumes may not be on fire. Do not release birds inside the building. Do not try to build the trampoline. Time to expand the list. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.